sport can give us many positive things. It can give positive things to participants, but it can also give positive things to fans. It, it can make us feel as though we're part of something larger than ourselves. It can give us joy when our favorite teams win. Hello, my name is Nathan Galloway, and I'm a broadcast journalist from Memphis. This documentary will dive into the topic of sport rivalry and its impacts on fans. When it comes to sports, rivalries are inevitable. Taking a closer look into one of the more popular rivalries can only help when talking about sport fan behavior. It's one of the best things in, in sports. You know, they talk about the Yankees, Red Sox, but I think that's a pure hate there with those two. There's a mutual respect between most Cardinal and Cub fans. The game just kind of has a little more meaning. Like, the, we won the tickets to this, to this game, and it was actually, they said, you pick what game you want to go to, and we kind of said, well, the White Sox aren't very good. When do they play the Cardinals? So it's kind of like, whenever it's a Cubs-Cards game, you know you're in for a good one. Just the atmosphere of when you're sitting around watching a ball game, and you have that diverse mix of just Cubs and Cards fans just watching something at once. There's almost a weird feeling of unity in just the sport itself. And so that it's meant a lot to me just to be able to have that odd type of unity even in disagreement, um, just watching that. And that's been a big part of my childhood and adulthood, and just watching those types of games with family members and friends. So when, when I first started researching rivalry, um, <clears throat> excuse me, there were not a lot of people researching rivalry. Um, there were a few outside of the sport setting who, were, who had done some studies with rivalry in management, in psychology, in general business. Um, however, there were not a lot of people within sport management researching what rivalry means to fans. Um, as we've moved along, that group has grown. It started with probably four or five people that were doing most of the work, and that has grown now to where we're beginning to see more people get into this field of study. Past research has identified 11 elements or antecedents to rivalry. These are the factors that make these competitions stand out above regular competitions against other opponents. But I will go through the factors uh, and descending order of how important fans say that these factors are to the rivalry. Versus frequency of competition, how regularly these two, two teams meet. Defining moment, these are memorable moments that have happened in the past uh, in the history of the rivalry. You know, stand out in the minds of the fans. One aspect of rivalry is embeddedness and a sense of shared history, and these defining moments contribute to that sense of shared history. Another is geography, how the two teams are uh, situated near each other. Uh, then there's recent and historical parity. So that's how competitive these two entities have been with each other over time. Competition for personnel is best seen in, uh, you know, at least in North American context, in college sports with recruiting. And two teams that might be going after the same athletes uh, to come to their schools to play. Star factor is the next one. Star factor is where we think of the great luminaries that have been part of this rivalry on either side of it. Whether it's famous coaches or players, these are these superstars that stand out when we think of these, um, the opponents or of the rivalry itself. Relative dominance is where one side has been particularly successful against the other. Cultural difference is the idea that the, the other group is very different from us in some way, so or the other organization. Now, often these differences are perceived as more than perhaps those outside the rivalry would see. Unfairness is where one side sees the other as being given preferential treatment by a governing body or by referees in some form. And then cultural similarity is seeing the other, you know, the opponent as very similar to oneself, and that helps contribute to the rivalry. 
After understanding what a rivalry is, it is important to know some of the benefits they bring. Here is Dr. Daniel Wan to talk more about that. Well, I think for one thing it can provide interest, right? That uh, it's always nice to have kind of that group that you see as the, the rival group, the out group. Again, assuming that it's, it stays in a safe and, and, and you know, clean and fun environment, then it's always nice to have some of that. The friendly rivalry adds intrigue. Uh, it it kind of adds some interest, some morale, some excitement to the, the event. Certainly fans get up for rival games. Um, there's nothing as sweet as winning and watching your rival lose as there is when you win and watch your rival lose in the same game. So I think that, uh, again, it, just, it adds interest, uh, adds excitement. As long as it's done safely, I mean, sometimes you get concerned that the rivalry can get over the top. For additional information about violence and deviance, here is Dr. Joe Cobbs. From a practitioner perspective, you want to sort of downplay the differences between the two organizations or between the two groups, and you want to try and play up uh, the similarities if you're trying to um, keep the animosity at a manageable or a, or a moderate level and obviously avoid violence. Another interesting aspect of rivalry is its relation to self-conscious emotions. Dr. Julie Partridge explains that self-conscious emotions are any emotions that are based on the idea of how we perceive ourselves in relation to others. Some examples of these emotions are pride, jealousy, and shame. Obviously, it seems like they would be uh, logical tie-ins with rivalries. Um, the idea of kind of where we rank compared to other people is important in determining some of these self-conscious emotions and certainly um, how we uh, relate to um, uh, or how we compare with uh, somebody that we would attach a lot of importance to, like a rival, becomes important as well. Those self-conscious emotions then can have big impacts on um, you know, specific outcomes like willingness to engage in aggressive acts or um, you know, the, the desire to withdraw from an activity. Um, so they, they seem like they would be um, useful for understanding the relationship between the two. One of the potential risks to keep in mind when it comes to rivalries is the possibility of fan deviance. Dr. Wan touches on that subject here. Now certainly within the rival context, it's all going to be magnified, right? So if a fan, if a fan misbehaves at a run-of-the-mill contest, heaven knows what that fan is going to do at a rivalry event. That's when all of that should be blown out of proportion. So I think that we should be concerned with this issue in all contexts. In the rivalry context, it's just that much more of a big deal because there's this added layer of, I just don't want my team to win, I want that team mm -hmm. to lose, and so there's more going on in terms of why I would act out the way I do. Dr. Wan also discussed the idea of using rivalry in sport as a teaching tool. Let's try and use sport to teach in this way. They've used sport to teach for 100 years, but they've not said, maybe we can use rivalry, the context of sport rivalry, to teach individuals to um, better handle when they find themselves in a rivalry environment. That is exactly what Dr. Havard is doing at the University of Memphis, along with help from some students. So the origin of sport rivalry, man, really comes from um, a rivalry and fan behavior class that I teach and in that we use I, I created stick figures um, in the PowerPoints to illustrate that one stick figure was named Jeff the other stick figure was named Jeffrey the only differences between the two was one was wearing a shirt of a certain color that said my team the other was wearing a shirt of a certain color that said their team and so it was um, kind of a, a, a representation that these two people are very similar, even the same. It's kind of like the ESPN commercial that used Manchester United and I believe Liverpool to illustrate the same thing. Um, that these two stick figures were essentially the same person. The only difference was they liked different teams. At the end of the course, uh, when we discuss Sport Rivalry Man, then one of the characters, Jeff or Jeffrey, actually becomes Sport Rivalry Man, and it's this superhero figure that um, his power is to tell people how to act toward the outgroup members um, and persuade people how to do that. And so I actually um, had someone 
design sport rivalry man. Um, and so that is, that's the cartoon, or that's the character you see in the comic strips and cartoons now. And I always tell people he acts somewhat like a Jiminy Cricket character would where in the stories, Adventures with Sport Rivalry Man, um, a person is put in a situation where they either have to decide not to bully someone online, not to bully someone in a schoolyard, um, to help a rival fan um, retrieve a hat that they've lost, to help a rival fan change a flat tire. Um, when is the appropriate time to cheer um, at a rivalry game, should they cheer if a rival player is hurt and things like that. And they have to make those decisions and then with the help of Sport Rivalry Man, again being that Jimmy Cricket or conscious character representation, um, they ultimately make the appropriate decision how they should treat outgroup members. And then at the end um, of the historical comics and cartoons, he discusses a rivalry phenomenon or term to kind of explain why people feel certain ways toward outgroup members that they do. And then at the end of the Adventures with Sport Rivalry Man, he kind of ties it up with a, the, gives the moral of the story and how people should treat others that like different teams. Two students who have worked on the Sport Rivalry Man comics and curriculum are Skylar Workman and Megan Lominick. So I am majoring in school counseling and when I saw some of these adventures with Sport Rivalry Man, I thought that they could be something that could be used for younger students to kind of show them um, to generalize rivalry to everyday life and kind of how you treat people and things like that. And so um, I kind of had the idea to make a curriculum of all of the Sport Rivalry Man adventures and put it into a school counseling um, place. And so I started making the curriculum and then I actually used them in the school um, with some students and so uh, they were able to kind of watch videos of Sport Rivalry Man and then talk about the things that Sport Rivalry Man was trying to teach them which is how to just behave properly. It, it kind of gave a fresh touch on everything because it's different than just the regular counseling lessons that they have normally done so it gave them a comic to look at, a video to watch and then there are also like activities that went along with it and so they kind of liked it because it was different and a lot of the kids that were in there were boys and so they really liked the sports. I think they can be very effective um, especially I think more so the sport rivalry man ones because um, they are geared more towards children and teaching them like lessons and so it's very um, understood Understandable, I guess, um, to children, and it's very, I think, relatable um, because even if they aren't, you know, big sports fans, it's still relating it to things that they go through, like being a new student or, um, you know, like following a crowd, like thinking they're supposed to do something like that. Um, and so, I think it's, I think it can be very effective towards um, teaching them right from wrong through that. Another feature of SportRivalry.com is the podcast that some of Dr. Havard's students work on. So This Week in Rivalry was a rivalry podcast, and it had to deal with different types of matchups uh, throughout the duration of the college football season. So you have you know, big games like Florida State, Miami. Of course, you have the Iron Bowl like Auburn, Alabama. Just for instance, those types of games, and just pretty much displaying to the audience what types of things to look forward to, the historical perspective, and even getting a perspective on the rivalry itself. Also getting to write up uh, different types of things having to deal with the upcoming rivalry games and what to actually look forward to. And so that, that's been a lot of fun and learning what to look forward to in terms of the collegiate games. I did a write up having to deal with five things to look for in each rivalry game. You know, it was kind of a trial by error, but from the product we started creating um, at the beginning of the semester compared to the product we had at the end of the semester, um, a, a complete 180 in my eyes. Um, and now as someone who is um, removed from podcast involvement and looking at um, what the group that is entrusted with this project now is doing with it, um, it's really gratifying to see um, the, the quality of the production, the, the quantity of the production uh, with the videos that they're doing, and also uh, this subject of sport rivalry um, across many different platforms is really cool to see. Um, 
And I think it's only going to help the development of this sport rivalry. Um, man, sport rivalry podcast, the videos, um, when the, the audience that we're broadcasting to um, just increases because it'll be um, just more people yearning for it. And I think the, the product that they're putting out now is something that is tangible um, and really relatable for kids all the way from elementary school to you know, college and beyond. The, the overall goal of this project is that people see the lessons using popular um, mediums like comics and cartoons, popular topics like sports and superheroes. People take the lessons that we are trying to teach and they take it outside of the sports setting. As discussed earlier, fan deviance is a serious issue. Skits at sporting events like this one can unintentionally condone deviance. Dr. Haver talks about the role organizations can have to help control it. If a fight breaks out in the stand at a rivalry game, the first thing that is going to happen is the organization is going to try to distance themselves from that, say they don't condone that type of behavior. Well, that's more difficult to do if the organization has run skits like this or they run promotions that in some way put a negative connotation on the rivalry. There, there are many kind of pitfalls that organizations can fall into if they don't try to responsibly promote rivalry or at least avoid um, promoting rivalry in a negative way. Rivalry is something that you have to take with a grain of salt. And so some people, they absolutely love it, they embrace it, they feel almost kind of like out of norm with it, if you will. So kind of just, I don't know the best way to describe it, maybe a level of um, hatred almost with it. And I've learned that you can't, you really can't take it that seriously. At the end of the day, it's a game. I think if you removed that element, um, uh, of malice and you replaced it with um, encouragement and kind of enticing each other to, um, to continue to, to elevate one another. Um, it would help all aspects of sport. Sport rivalry does not need to be violent um, or, or harmful to one another. Um, it can be um, enticing and uh, riveting uh, for all parties involved. In the end though, really, I think rivalry becomes what, as Reggie Jackson said, uh, the straw that stirs the drink. Uh, that is, sport rivalry is, is the, the part of fandom um, or the process by which fandom uh, becomes interesting to people. Um, and it allows me to say that my name is Rick Grieve. My favorite hockey team is the Nashville Predators. And my second favorite hockey team is whatever team is playing the Chicago Blackhawks. Go Preds. After completing this documentary, it's pretty easy for me to see how my personal fandom has changed from the start of it to completing it. Uh, I'm a Cardinals fan, so I definitely relate to the Cardinals and Cubs rivalry kind of mentioned early on in this documentary. Uh, before, I kind of looked at Cubs fans and their entire fan base in a negative way and at times hated, hated Cubs fans. But now, after completing this documentary and learning all aspects of it, I've kind of taken a step back and really looked at how I viewed them before and now I kind of look at them in a more positive way. I still do not like Cubs or Cubs fans, but I don't think I have that kind of hatred or malice towards them anymore.